tightness or, or basic fabric composition that's not that far off a lot of those garments. You know, I mean, I'm looking at I'm looking at your at your shirt there. You know, I mean, uh, just looking at you sitting and looking at the zigzag pattern of folds going down your chest and with your sleeves pushed up, you see the those real tight creased folds. Um, you know, looking looking at you sitting here with your arms crossed. Arm crossed is a very common thing to have a soldier relaxed. Uh, you can see the way the clothes gather and the way they bunch up. You know, in this area. You know, and, and the other thing is trousers. You know, guys standing in looser, you know, someone someone wearing looser jeans. I mean, uh, uh, standing up, they look one way. You know, bending over, they look a little different. You know, they, they bunch up in a certain way. And once you get a basic idea of how, the, how certain clothes that are certain fullnesses react to the human body, it's really not that hard to, to approximate it. Every once in a while, you get a pose that's like, well, shoot, how's this going to look, you know? And, and if that's the case, I just... I just kind of go into the, we got a nice big mirror in the bathroom, I'll just go in there and just kind of like, see, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even graze an eyebrow around the house, you know, with that kind of strange behavior either. Okay, now I got, I got another toothpick here, it's a lot sharper than the other one you can see. This one is really for doing wrinkles and folds, and I'm going to start behind this guy's knee, and one of the one of the things about the, the Duro putty is that, what, and, and one of the things you see with wrinkles and folds more than anything else is you see a zigzag pattern. Look around at each other and look at the clothes on the people around you. I bet you you can find some place where their clothing, clothing's under stress where you can see some kind of a, some kind of a zigzag pattern. Um, when clothes bunch up, especially around the knees, they tend to, they tend to fold up in a zigzag to a zigzag sort of effect. So this is a really, really good um, thing to make, take note of when you're sculpting because it, it really will help you um, solve a lot of little problems. You know, how's, how, how, are his, how are these clothes gonna, gonna lay on this guy, you know, based on what he's doing? I know it gets all a little esoteric, but uh, The other thing that's interesting is, um, even though Civil War clothes were generally made out of wool, um, you know, you have some cotton shirts and things like that, but um, generally made out of wool, I like to put, they were also clothes that were lived in for a long time. I mean, these guys didn't exactly have some big old wardrobe traveling around where they were, they were able to put on fresh underwear and fresh pants every day. Uh, you know, there wasn't a Chinese laundry, you know, on campaign. I mean, a lot of these guys wore these same clothes for literally weeks at a time. Uh, and, and eventually, when they, when they got to change, it meant burning the clothes you were wearing. <laughs> it meant because new clothes had just come in. So what it meant was that the areas on the clothing where there was a lot of wear, that, that wear, at least in my imagination, almost got almost becomes permanent in the appearance of the clothes. And so I like to put a lot of little uh, kind of um, wear creases in, you know, across the, across the top of the thigh, behind the knee, just areas to, to show that, you know, these clothes have been creased in that way so often those creases just don't seem to really, really go away. So I'm going to pass this around to you guys in a minute just to give you an idea. Now again, you're what rolling doing. those wrinkles in. Basically. In some areas I am, in other areas I'm just creasing, but I'm also trying to make sure I keep some sharpness to them. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just be pushing the, mm -hmm. the toothpick in. You're trying to create, you're trying to create some resistance um, and uh, that the fabric will kind of... Well, wherever there's a crease, there's a bulge. Exactly. That's exactly right. <coughs> This is looking pretty good, actually. But I want you to see this kind of zigzag effect. I'm going to pass this around here. Now, is that toothpick uh, cover super good? Yeah. Yep. So you basically make your own tools that way. I, mean, I do. I, I've probably made thousands of mm -hmm. these suckers over the years. Where they've all gone, I've never thrown one away, so yeah. where they've all gone, I don't know, so. Okay, I 
think this is looking pretty reasonably presentable. Eh, it's not quite there, but I think it's there far enough to pass it around. Again, just kind of hold it by the upper <coughs> body. Just don't hold anything that's green. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's one of those if you want to just have a look at that. Now it's really worn out. You see it's all kind of blackened from uh, just it's probably kind of nasty. <laughs> well, you should, probably should Grand run some rubber gloves or something before you How long does it around. take to dry before you can apply paint? Well, I, I don't, I'm too impatient, so I won't just let it dry. Uh, mine, mine go into the oven at about 170 degrees, which all it does is just speed up the curing time for about a half an hour. 25 minutes is my accustomed duration. 170 degrees for 25 minutes. When the timer goes off, I go down, fetch him, and go on to the next thing. Um, and the one thing that's important to remember also, when you're working with a 54 millimeter figure, you're working, you're working with a figure that's you know, a, a pretty small object. I mean, you know, you're looking at something that's, what, two and a half inches, two and a quarter inches tall. Um, if you try to sculpt too much at one time, you, you know, you finish one section, you say, oh, gosh, that's just that's not good, right. I got some putty left here. Hey, why don't I do this part, too? And you start doing that, and all of a sudden you realize... I got my thumb right in what I just finished. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can't even tell you how often that's happened. Mm -hmm. So you you got to be you got to be kind of patient. Do it one bit at a time. If you're going to stretch it a little more and try to do a little more, be really careful because nothing's more irritating than getting something just the way you want it, and then it's gone. Um, do you sculpt separately? certain pieces of equipment before you apply them? Yes. Yes. Very good question. Um, I generally don't like to sculpt much equipment on the figure at all. Um, most things I'll sculpt separately. If it's a uh, canteen or a, or a binocular case or a pistol holster mm -hmm. or a cartridge box or anything else. Or belting or things like belting that. On, belting I'll sculpt on. Oh, yeah. Belting, I will, because the belting has to kind of press into the fabric a little bit it, because it's going to be cinched up. Uh, there has to be a little bit of, uh, of uh, you know, like yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it, there's got there's got to be some inner it's interaction with, with, the the clothing. with the clothing. It's really hard to to just make belting and then just put it on after the figure's dry because then it tends to perch up on top mm -hmm. of the clothes. Mm -hmm. Whereas in reality, the weight of whatever the equipment's holding is going to dig into the clothing and it's going to create separate folds and everything else. So if I'm putting like suspenders or cross belts or whatever else, I'll try to, depending on what they're made of, if they're, if they're a real firm like leather cross belt, real thick, heavy leather cross belt, going across the shoulder and then catching something down here, I might do that separate and do it later. But things like uh, suspenders or braces or waist belts or things like that, I'll try to do those while the putty is wet so I can at least get them pushed in a little bit. And then while the putty is wet around them, I want to do some folds and some wrinkles and some, something to, to show that the fabric is reacting to, that, to the presence of that belt. You don't want to just have belts just perched on top of clothing because it doesn't just doesn't look natural. But uh, yeah, some t in, in some like cases a, yes. Like a GI Joe that you yeah, it, it, exactly. Well, like a GI Joe that's all made of porcelain, yeah. you know, uh, because it, it, GI Joe at least you have fabric. I mean, you know, you, it's, it's got clothing on, you know. Okay, so I got that guy that part done. I'm gonna see if I can see how far I can get with his boots here. Let's see. Let's see how this works out. The boots aren't a problem doing now, but I'm, I'm wondering, well, first of all, I have to make sure I don't put my thumb in my trousers here that I just, that I just painted, or sculpted, rather. But let's try putting, uh, let's try putting this, um, oh yeah, I'm probably going to need that guy. Now, I start off with the same shoe for all my figures. This one actually lost a little bit of the heel when I was drilling it out. I've got to rebuild that a little bit. Um, his left shoe. Well, the, the heel of the shoe is pretty much look the same on each side, but but again, I'm using the rolling motion to get this around. But I'm starting with a shoe, and I'm just adding the boot top to turn this shoe into a boot. And again, this is really important that 
you know, you look at the photograph and you get familiar with what the shape of that boot's going to be. These are these aren't big old clunky galoshes. These are these were fairly expensive custom-made leather boots these guys got. So that they were intended to they didn't buy them just off the shelf. These were these were made for these guys. So they're going to fit pretty nicely to that guy's calf. So you want to make sure you don't make these boots too clunky. Civil War uh, period uniforms at this time still had a certain element of elegance to them and uh, custom custom fit, at least to the officers' clothing anyway. Listed men kind of took whatever showed up in a, in the, uh, from the supply depot, but the officers had to maintain a certain level of uh, professionalism in their dress. So uh, you got to be careful to make sure your boots don't look like big old clunky galoshes that you'd wear out to shovel snow in. Didn't the majority of the officers ride, even though they weren't necessarily in the cavalry unit? Um, officers above, as I, re I, Jim might know better than I do, but as I recall, officers that were above the rank of lieutenant uh, had a horse. Mm -hmm. I think that's correct. Uh, I think lieutenants didn't get a horse. I think they marched with the men, uh, lieutenants, second lieutenants, the lower, the lower grade officers did not ride. Captains and above had horses. Um, going into battle, uh, I think the only officers that were ever mounted going in, going actually into battle in an infantry regiment were general officers. And even in that case, I know at the Battle of Gettysburg, Pickett's Charge, there were only it was only noteworthy. It was noteworthy that there were, I think, at least two generals that I can think of who went in on a horseback. One of them was Garnet, and also, Bar well, Barksdale was the day before he went in on horseback. Um, but you were a you were a big time target on horseback. I mean, everybody on the, everybody could see you above the smoke. I mean, you were basically you might as well just been wearing a big old shirt saying "Shoot me." One of, one of the reasons why you know the, the jackets were more utilitarian is they didn't show up. Quite as much to the yeah, the but they probably you know back then it was still considered a little bit gauche to to make a point of shooting at officers in the early part of the war. By the end of the war, there weren't any such uh, there weren't any such predilections about shooting at officers, and and marksmen made a point of trying to pick off officers. John Sedgwick, uh, commander of the Sixth Corps of the uh, Army of the Potomac, was was famously killed by a sniper at the Battle of Spotsylvania. Um, okay, well, I got this. is looking pretty good. Um, again, I haven't I haven't put any folds yet in the bottom of that boot. Again.